I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Abington School Committee for uh, Tuesday, September 25th, 2018 here at the Middle High School Library. Um, before we start, I'd just like to have everybody stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to welcome a new member, a student representative from the high school, Cameron Kearney. Cameron, you're a junior. That's great. Cameron's a junior at the high school. He'll be here for our meetings going forward. Um, so welcome and thank you. Thank you for volunteering. Um, and hearing of visitors, anybody who would like to speak at this point on anything? Dr. Sullivan? I figured if I, I saw something on the informational items and I didn't get to, I wasn't here in June, so I thought I, it doesn't usually get addressed and I usually just, so I thought I could address it. Okay, no yeah, problem. no problem, yep. Um, I noticed uh, that there's a, a memo from uh, Mr. Schaefer to, to me that's uh, sent, that's, you know, in your, your packet. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it felt uncomfortable at the very least that a uh, memo from the superintendent is sent in a public uh, forum. Okay. Uh, so I figured I would take the opportunity to, you know, answer any questions you might have about, you know, what we've been doing with the schedule. Okay. Uh, I know I wasn't here on June 19th um, at your last meeting, but, um, you know, I actually am actually a paid consultant for um, scheduling around the, the, uh, the state. And um, since 2013, I've been involved in the scheduling committee, a district-wide committee. So I've brought a lot of ideas around schedule to the school committee over, over the years. Um, and so uh, we are going to look at schedules around social emotional learning particularly. So um, I think it was um, Danielle, Danielle that brought it up around the rotating schedule. And uh, Massachusetts Secondary School Administrative Association now you know, combined with elementary um, has a lot of these schedules available on the site for what matches your school. Um, I, I wanted to say I would come and answer any questions at any time about what we have done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, and I, I think we have you know, a schedule fatigue among you know, a lot of directors and department heads who have worked you know, tirelessly on presenting schedules. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, what happens is we can't afford the schedule. Um, and so I, I want to come sooner rather than later on a regular basis around where we are because I don't want to go through all of this work all year or for two years and, and get here and say, you know, we can't get a full-time English teacher. We have to have part-time. And part-time people definitely impacts rotating schedules. Um, they're not going to want to move their schedule from Monday, I teach period one, two, and three. And Thursday, I teach periods, you know, in the afternoon or I teach in the mornings. And so there are, you know, there are partial rotating schedules. There's a hundred different schedules you can look at. But, you know, I wanted to make sure that we talked about it pretty regularly. Um, okay. Some of the things that have impacted our in scheduling our, our buses. You know, we, we have, we propose great schedules that, are, that make sense around, that's in the best interest of students for social emotional reasons and for student achievement. But if the decision is going to be, there's no money, do it as is, don't propose anything that's gonna go outside the parameters. I think I'd rather, you know, make sure we're talking about that upfront and early mm -hmm. because a lot of people have put a ton of time into, you know, different schedule proposals. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to you know, be able to answer any questions you might have and specifics about you know, what you would like to see happen. I think the other thing is, you know, we had just approved a, a school improvement plan either in April and May. Um, so it's, it's not specifically in the school improvement plan mm -hmm. for this year, mm -hmm. but I think under the guise of several things, under the guise of standard, you know, our first goal around student achievement, we can look at it. Uh, on the, 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 the goal around social emotional learning, we want to look at it, I think more broadly, we were going to look at schedules to include sort of flex time, um, mm -hmm. uh, more of like an advisory type period where, where students have some time to connect to a teacher or guidance or homework or extra help or makeup time or so. A lot of schools are imp imp you know, importing something like that around mm -hmm. the schedule. So it'd probably be more broad than, than just rotating because I think that's, that's the angle we can look at it. But I also wanted to be honest and say our first priorities are going to be around the technology one-to-one -one initiative. There's a lot of time and energy going into getting that. Uh, right, and the NEASC um, visit. Mm -hmm. So we have one NEASC visit in November, that's the collaborative conference, and they'll, they're they gonna give us a, a additional school improvement goals that yeah. I'll be sharing with you. Okay. Um, they'll give me a timeline, and I'll pass that along when I have to share that with you about um, what we have to do there. Okay. So I just wanted to give a chance to talk. Okay, no, no, I appreciate it. I think, I think the, origin, in the original objective, I think we were looking to see <laughs> the feasibility of it. Um, what would be affected 
if we did do something to that effect. And it was more of a, a living, breathing type of So I'm glad you're here today to, to talk about it anyway. So I think that was the, ori like the original um, ask, I guess I'll say, like, where, what could, if we, what would it take to have this happen? And then at that point, we start to look at different alternatives. Does it make sense? And things like that. Could we, I mean, how much would it, what would the cost, would it be a cost mm -hmm. impact? What would it be? So I think that's where. And, and I just from. wanted to be, you know, clear that I would come anytime, every time. Mm -hmm. I, and I didn't want the perception to be that I needed a, a, a memorandum from the superintendent, from the school committee, that the directive that was going to be posted publicly to, you know, I, I would come anytime, mm -hmm. I would come often. So it felt very awkward and very uncomfortable. Okay. So I, I didn't mean it for it to feel like that. So, so I wanted a chance to say, you know, I'm, I've never not, you know, mm -hmm. I would always come and provide whatever you want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. Um, here, now I'm going to move on to the reading and approval of records. First, we have um, executive session minutes from August 28, 2018. Um, if you get a chance to look them over and um, make a motion when you get a chance for um, to pass them. Executive session. Now. Yes, yes. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then moving on, we're um, going to be the minutes from our regular meeting on the same night, August 28th. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. And all in favor of it? Aye. 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 All right, that's out of the way. Um, principal report, Dr. Sullivan, did you want to? Uh, because I had um, presented or passed in the application for the National Blue Ribbon School Program last year, and there's so many new, new members, I thought I'd provide you a copy of that application. Um, we expected to have a, a response um, before this meeting, but we don't have one. Um, so I can't tell you whether we have or we haven't. Along the Blue Ribbon, um, it's it's the it says that we'll know in September. It's pretty late in September. Um, I'm pretty confident that this is you know something that I think um, we we seem to have qualified in, in all levels that I can see, unless I'm missing something. But uh, I do want to thank um, Assistant Principal Luco, Kim McHugh, um, the, the both of those co-chair on the ES Steering Committee, Christina Sweeney, Guidance Council, and Department Heads and Directors who helped write this. But as you can imagine. It was a pretty lengthy, uh, a lot of work to do to set aside some time um, because when you are you are nominated to be a Blue Ribbon School based on a year before's uh, MCAS achievement, and the nomination is an invitation to apply, basically. It says you, you will qualify to apply, but they don't tell you, you know, that, by the way, this is going to take, you know, several <laughs> days of your life um, to do this. And then they respond and they tell you things to fix and change, and so um, this is what we proposed that we provided to them, and I thought it was just even interesting for people that might be, yeah. you know, new on the committee, um, a little bit of historical perspective as well. Um, uh, the reason that we were nominated was for closing achievement gaps. So not this, there's two categories: ones for high achieving schools and ones for closing achievement gaps. Um, so for us, it was about closing achievement gaps. So you can see that a lot of the uh, narrative is about um, what we do for low-income students and special education students. I don't know if you have any questions on the, on the application itself but it certainly will come back as soon as I know something. Well, thank you for including it. It was really informative to read because I'm a new person on the committee, right. so reading it was, was great to get all the information. So, And you'll see some similar ones with ask as well. <laughs> okay. And it sounds like some point this week you're hoping uh, anyway. Hopefully. Yeah. Yes, if uh, Betsy DeVos can. And how will we be notified? <laughs> um, we, uh, we'll, I believe I'll be notified by email, um, but she will make a public announcement, um, like in a YouTube announcement, and then um, if we are included as a school, we are invited to the Blue Ribbon Ceremony uh, in D.C. Okay. So can I just yeah. comment yep. briefly? So there are literally hundreds and hundreds of schools in Massachusetts. And you know that Abington High School was commended, uh, one of seven schools that, that were commended by the Acting Commissioner of Education last year in the state of Massachusetts, the highest achieving state in the nation. And so that's what you had to do just to qualify to apply. 
basically. And then the hard work to apply was done. And nationally, there are thousands of schools. Uh, and so this is a very prestigious award, probably the most prestigious award that a school that can be bestowed upon a school nationally. And so um, we're very proud of the work that's been done, the effort that's been done. It's been um, more people than we could ever recognize as individuals at a meeting like this um, because it's inclusive of, uh, of our students and um, their grit and their determination to be successful. And that goes back to the social emotional piece and how our uh, students are supported here at Abington High School. And so it's something that we're all very proud of, that we're just in the running. And um, I know that uh, Dr. Sullivan wouldn't, wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have us on the agenda if we weren't, um, I don't think, cautious, I don't think uh, cautiously optimistic is the way to describe uh, the feeling about um, our potential here. I think we're pretty optimistic about our potential here. So, Look forward to hearing officially. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you to everybody, you. too, that participated in getting it done. Um, really quick before I forgot, um, Jeanette Leary could not be here tonight. She's traveling for work. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. I meant to say in the beginning and skip my mind. Um, Chris, just a quick question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is this available in the um, mint on the documents online, the application, or is this just for our packet? It's online. Because um, it is eight to nine pages worth of some really, um, especially for someone like me who doesn't have a child in high school, I think that anyone who's interested in hearing some of the wonderful things that are happening um, at Abington High School and just there's really a theme throughout this document. Um, I enjoyed. I went through it a few times and. It, the social emotional piece, I just, it, it's a credit it, and it speaks to vision. Um, I think that there's just a really clear vision at Abington High School and not just, um, we're getting a lot of accolade and recognition lately in, in the way of academics, athletics, but there's just a theme of uh, raising some really good people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I could definitely read that through those pages. So I, I just encourage people to check it out because um, there's a lot of good information in the packet. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you again, Dr. Sullivan. Um, do you know? Do you? Hi. So we're having some technical difficulty with okay. connecting, and James is making copies. He's on his way out, okay. but the printer got stuck. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of all the way around. Okay. All the technology. That's fine. Um, so he's on his way out. You want to skip to you? Sure. Okay. We're going to skip to the uh, report of superintendent of schools then while we wait. So um, thank you. One of the things that occurred this year with our new schedule is we had our opening day after our first school committee meeting. And I don't want to, one of the things I do is I do, I give a back to school report. I don't want to report on those things that I've already reported on that we anticipated with, this, with an opening would go smoothly. Um, nothing is 100%. Um, it was a smooth opening. Um, that's not to say that there weren't um, people that were concerned about bus stops or classes or schedules or, um, but overall, uh, as a system, we have set sail for this academic year. And um, it was, a, it was a, a highly successful launch overall. One of the things that was uh, in, uh, different this year was uh, in the first, uh, in the opening of school in the first couple of days, in the second week, in the first week of school, we passed out 900 laptop computers to uh, just under 900 laptop computers to the students in grades 7 through 12. So um, there was a lot of work that went into that launch, and that's not to say that was an absolutely perfect launch. Um, you always work for perfect, um, and uh, but it was it was a good it was a good launch of that program. Um, we had professional development over the last couple of. Uh, a couple of days each year for the last couple of years in anticipation of this. We had professional development at the opening of school, which this committee helped us establish, and that was appreciated. That went, that went well as a district. Um, we've had uh, newsletters and uh, parent orientations and evenings and open houses. There was a one-to-one -one computer night for our parents. Um, there was a Q&A that you may have seen uh, was released. That's an attachment in your, in your uh, packet. Um, when our students go off to uh, working lives or to college, um, these are the tools they're going to be using. It's going to take us as a system 
uh, quite some time to to use these as, as tools for teaching and learning um, to do it to, to continue to do it right and so we're in that process now this effort has also uh, paid dividends for our elementary level because at, at the elementary level now I'm very confident and comfortable saying we have a two to one computer ratio in our classrooms and each day our elementary students grow in their level of sophistication in how to use these tools uh, you can't uh, teach a teacher or teach a student how to use these tools in a classroom setting until everybody has one. You can, you can front load professional development, but until you get into the weeds and you use them as tools and you try to apply those things that you're learning in professional development, um, you, you, don't, you don't make your greatest traction. So we're making that traction now throughout our entire school system, um, pre-K through, through 12. Um, we'll continue to grow and improve in that, and I just want to publicly acknowledge the work of our Director of Technology, uh, Rich Bykowski, uh, because he uh, has been uh, the architect of much of this and the collaborator and the coordinator of, of much of this, and uh, it's just a very, very exciting way to start a school year and jump into what is the most current trend, uh, trends and delivery of information and teaching and learning and assessments um, by, by using these tools to help our students. Um, again, what's exciting about it is these are the tools. When they go to college, this is what they're going to be using. When they go to work, this is what they're going to be using. So um, we're just very excited about that. So answer questions people might have. Or Have there been, um, did this help to resolve some questions? Was um, What other kind of questions maybe that's not on here have you gotten? Regarding it? I think it has. Um, there's been some pop-up ads on people that use YouTube that's to be expected. Um, when you've got 900 different users going to multiple sites every night, our firewalls, our protections are pretty good. They're not impervious. They're not perfect. Um, the, uh, I think we had one that broke. Um, some, I think they closed a, a, the laptop on a pen that was inadvertent. Um, the um, the Q&A addressed what we found to be the most pervasive questions that people were having. Mm -hmm. um, and if there are more, we're not going anywhere. We're here to answer those questions, so. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Um, my next item is um, more ministerial than anything else. Okay. I don't get paid to be on the board of directors at North River Collaborative. I'm actually the, the president this year, um, but I need your permission to be a voting member there. Okay, so um, if any, nobody has any questions, I was looking for a, mo a motion to appoint Peter Schaefer as a voting member on the North River Collaborative board of directors for the 2018-19 school year. I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll take the next one. Um, I'm going to, I'll take the next thing on the agenda. Um, so back in our May meeting, we had appointed uh, Chris O'Neill as our, so every committee in town, I don't know if that's every, but appoint somebody to be their member on the Abington Cam Board of Directors. Um, we had appointed Chris O'Neill. He had to resign. Um, they have an annual meeting coming up on October 18th. So they're looking for us to appoint somebody in the, now to take that spot, um, I believe. So we received two emails. Um, the whole committee's got, I, I know I got one, I sent to everybody, and we received another one from Jim Connolly and uh, Chris Prowl, who I believe are both here. Um, since you're both here, I'll ask you, do either of you, would either of you like to say anything or just speak to what you sent us? I'm gonna leave it up to you. No, I wrote a statement if you Sure, Jim, just come up to the podium, please. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Jim Carney. I'm here to ask you to appoint me to the Board of Directors of uh, uh, Abington Community Access and Media. I've only recently found out about what Abington Cam is supposed to be, and I say it's time that we move forward. Abington Cam has been under the same leadership with the same few employees for the past nine years. During much of that time, the Board of Director meetings weren't held, income taxes weren't filed for seven years, and Abington Cam lost their 501c3 status. Under the new leadership since June, they're now working to restore the 501c3 status and have started holding directors' meetings. 
as I understand it from attending a few of those meetings, Avenue Cam has one full-time employee, two part-time employees, and only one volunteer. Whereas East Bridgewater, which is comparable to Abington, has almost three employees and 236 volunteers. The website looks like a major television studio, and ours is frankly boring. Um, over the past many years, there's been little community outreach by the studio. Abington Cam is a nonprofit on a limited budget funded by a shrinking number of subscriber franchise fees. We built a new school, we built a new studio, and we've been here for a, a year. Uh, we need some fiscal responsibility on the, on the uh, board, and we need to develop a long-term business plan. We need to start taking advantage of the new location, new location in the high school, and we need to encourage students to get involved by becoming interns and volunteers. We need to use our website and other social media to reach out to the scouts, the seniors, other civic organization, other groups and individuals in town. Community access television is supposed to be all about community involvement and volunteerism, using social media to reach our residents and draw them in to get creative and produce their own shows, which, isn't, which hasn't been happening. The three channels we have are routinely in a bulletin board mode, and very few shows are aired. Most shows are either municipal meetings or football games. Um, Abington, Abington Cam is Abington Community Access and Media. We got the media part down pretty good, but we need the community access now. I want to be a director and be involved in promoting the studio and encouraging our residents to come to Abington Camp. I want to bring transparency, oversight, and a spirit of collaboration and community to the board of directors in the Abington Camp studio that has been, um, that's greatly needed. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and can we get a new finial for the flag? He only has one wing. Aww. <laughs> We can look at that. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Chris, do you, Chris, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, yeah, hi. So uh, I've worked uh, or volunteered for Abington Cam for the better part of a decade now. Uh, been through the organization um, since it was still uh, a Comcast organization. It wasn't a private organization since then. Um, it has lacked the leadership of a board of directors meeting uh, regularly in order to accomplish the goals that uh, that need to be met for the organization to succeed. Um, and so I, I've been uh, a large part of the conversations lately about uh, what the organization's plan is moving forward with its board of directors and uh, what their goals should be so far. And having attended all these meetings, I'm a little concerned at the, the current direction of the board, some of the decisions that they were looking to make uh, given the funds that they had. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in taking a much more hands-on role with the organization, uh, bringing my expertise to the table here. Um, I'm a little concerned that currently um, there's sort of a lack of experience of the members on the board in dealing with uh, what is a, 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 like a television station. Um, and I feel that uh, industry experience would be very valuable uh, in, in this organization, and I look forward to answering any questions that the board might have uh, going forward. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have a question. What was your role over the past nine years? You have been with them for nine years, you sure. said? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, a little over that, yeah. So in that part time, I've worked um, while also attending school full time. Uh, I've uh, helped contribute to the website as well as basically, I mean, uh, there, there weren't many jobs that I couldn't do in the old studio. Since then, we moved to a new studio, upgraded to all new equipment. Uh, Justin Shanahan, who is the current uh, access director for the organization, um, he was instrumental in making sure that we were able to move to the brand new studio and this new facility. Uh, and uh, I've worked very closely with him in that time. We've accomplished a lot at this organization. I think there's a lot more work to be done. I think a lot of that revolves around outreach, but what we've lacked in the past has been sort of this long-term plan um, for the organization. So I think that's uh, really what needs to be focused on here. So how come if after, like, if you've been with them for nine years, that now you want to make an improvement? Uh, mm, this time I'm, I'm out of school, I, so I graduated from Boston College from the, the business school there, and I would love to take that expertise where I also studied film uh, and use that on, on the board of directors. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Oh, so I have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, you were, uh, I think uh, Mr. Conley and you as well, uh, both were talking about um, like the, director, the board of directors um, 
the, like the, the meetings haven't been held recent and until recently. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, the board like looking like? Is it just uh, Mr. Shanahan? No, so uh, Mr. Shanahan is actually uh, the only full-time employee of the organization. So currently there's a five-member board. Uh, the school committee gets to appoint one, board of, uh, one member of the board of directors. The selectmen's committee gets to appoint one member to the board. And then there are three elected positions. And currently those three elected positions are held and up for re-election uh, for this October 18th meeting. And then at that meeting, I believe the plan is for those three directors to also run for re-election. Okay. Uh, so, but in the past, it's only sort of met recently, and so for the period of time that we're talking about in these earlier nine years, there, there was no regular meeting of any members of this board of directors. Uh, and so a lot of the work didn't get done, and so they're in a huge catch-up mode right now. And so a lot of the members that have recently joined have only been there for the past couple of months and have had a lot to deal with taking on just everything about the organization, um, and I think it could just use some help. So the members that have just come on within the last couple of months, they're going to be up for re-election? Yes. In October? Yes. Have the selectmen already appointed somebody? No. No. Um, so currently they have an appointee that is serving currently, and her term uh, continues uh, through this election. Yeah. But my concern generally has been that these, these other three positions that weren't appointed by two boards, uh, should be elected positions by members of the organization and currently they're mostly appointed boards because they're interim positions uh, And so I'd be interested in I've heard talks that they're they're planning on rewriting the bylaws in order to eliminate the voting rights of the members uh, Such that only current directors would then be able to appoint uh, You know uh, the directors to follow that which uh, I disagree with I think sort of removes some of the basic uh, rights that we give to the members of the organization to have their say community access um, And so I've been pretty vocal about that Thank every How long are the terms? Uh, I believe it's either two or three years. It depends. The appointed positions are a little different. Okay, just curious. So when you go to a board of directors meeting, the members are also allowed to come, but they... So the members should be allowed to come under the current bylaws. In the new version of the bylaws, the current board has also um, not included the right to an open public meeting, which I've also noted on my, my message. Now, this was an early draft, but... I, I was concerned when I saw that first draft. They, they had said that they had simplified the bylaws, um, and I was a little concerned that that seemed more than a simplification. Okay. Good. Yeah. Everybody, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, that being so, we did have emails from Jim and Chris. That being said, um, we're, we can nominate, you can nom nominate anybody you want. You can't nominate any of us five that are currently sit on the board. So if anybody feels comfortable making a motion to um, nominate somebody to serve as the appointment of, uh, uh, the school committee's appointment to the Abington Cam Board of Directors. Um, look for it. I'll make a motion to I'll nominate Jim Connolly. I'll second it. Are there any other? <laughs> Uh, motions to nominate anybody? Is this, can you just give me the rundown or does this work the way that our other one worked? So we're just taking one. We're Take, and then we'll vote after, correct? Right. So, unless you want to. So, I mean, unless, right. would anybody, is there any other nominations for anyone? I don't want to confuse things, but I, I'm interested in, in Chris's perspective. So you want to nominate Chris? Yeah. Okay, is there a second to nominate Chris? always do this to me. <laughs> I'll, make this, I'll make the second. I'll make the second to nominate Chris Prawl. So first we're going to take a vote for uh, Jim Connolly to be the member of the board of the Abington Camp Board of Directors. Um, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. You can. You can do whatever you want. Um, now I take a vote for Chris Prawl as the Abington Camp Member Board of Directors. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, as of now, with only two votes, we have to have majority. So we do not have, um, we do not, we cannot appoint anybody at this time. Um, we can revisit it later on. Um, but at this time, uh, it's got to remain open until at least the next month. And then we re vote on it. We can, for the, yep. next, mm -hmm. for the next month. Yep. So would they come again and speak? Where That's up to them, okay. entirely up to them. Okay. So I'm going to move on to 
what we skipped over, the report of the Director of Student Services. Can, we just say, can I just say thank you guys both Yes, for thank coming. you both. Thank you both for coming. Thank and you both for your interest. It. And because I think you're great. Like, I just, I'm sorry. <laughs> James, you want to go? Yeah. yeah. So uh, thanks everyone. Originally there was planned to be a PowerPoint um, accompanying the speech, um, and I believe there should be one in your notes. And um, part of I think there was a delay up here, maybe uh, it's like a lapse of momentum while it's down um, <laughs> making copies. Um, but there should be enough for everyone here. Okay. <laughs> so feel free to follow along, but I'll make it um, auditorily friendly so that you can do a lot. So I just want to spend about um, three to five minutes with you. I'm talking about um, the corrective action plan as, um, that our district has submitted about a week ago and um, professional development activities um, in the special education department. So I'm pretty sure that in the year, uh, in the previous year, this um, committee's heard a bunch about the coordinated program with you. Is that correct? Um, yeah, yes. Okay. So. Um, the coordinated program review, just as a reminder, is when the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education audits a um, audits the school board um, or, or audits the, the school district um, to just see if we're in compliance with special education, civil rights, and English language education requirements. Um, and for a school district, it can actually represent um, a great opportunity to enhance our practices. Um, and so, like I said, we, we received the, um, the findings at the end of last year, and I met with the representative of the department um, at the end of August. And um, what they found um, repeatedly is just sort of that our, our district wasn't consistently um, evaluating our programs. And so I had said earlier that I, I think it is a little bit of an opportunity for school districts um, because it reminds us of what we can do to enhance our programming for special education, um, students with 504s, uh, 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 our diverse student body, and um, English language learners. Um, so first up, I just want to um, let you know what we'll be doing to evaluate our special education program um, this year. And this will involve um, you know, quite a time commitment and resources, and that's why I'm bringing it to your attention. Um, so first up, with the special ed program review, um, the legal standard is that our um, school districts have an obligation to regularly review uh, their special educa education programs and produce a formal report, a summary of observations, and next steps. So for us to respond um, to this legal standard, what we're going to do is we're going to do a formal evaluation of our pre-K, kindergarten, first, and second grade special ed programs. The reason why we've decided on these programs is that when, with respect to pre-kindergarten, uh, the enrollment has doubled in the last five years, and um, also the number of referrals jumped by half during the previous school year, so we're just having to respond to a much larger um, student, uh, we're just having to service a lot more students and we wanna make sure our, our programming is strong in that area. Additionally, um, at the Beaverbrook, we, we've had quite a number, we've had quite a rise of the number of students enrolled in our substantially separate program. And um, we think that just by evaluating this program, we can um, make sure that we're using best practices with these vulnerable students. And we'll be contracting with uh, Dorsey Yearly, who's a retired uh, special education director for, from the town of Wellesley, and was also the um, director of the Edco Collaborative. She's performed these evaluations for a number of uh, really high quality, uh, really high performing districts such as Dover, Sherborne, and Holliston, and also some regional districts like Randolph. Um, so that will be our special education program evaluation. So that'll be done this year and will be reported out to the school committee. Um, the second program evaluation that we're responsible for this year is what's called an institutional self-evaluation. So the legal standard here is that school districts are responsible annually to evaluate their programs to ensure that all students have access, regardless of sex, gender identity, race, disability status, religious identity, and housing status. So it's a, it's a yearly res responsibility, but the language of it is, is as you can see, very broad. Um, there's actually no general set standard about how a school district should do this. So what we'll be doing um, between, uh, over, over the course of this year is we'll be conducting a survey 
Um, and this will be distributed to staff at each building, um, to parents through constant contact, and to secondary students. We'll be adapting the Positive School Climate Toolkit, which was developed for the Minneapolis Public Schools. And just so you know, like some of the types of questions on, on, this, um, on this survey. So for students, um, it'll be a Likert scale, so that means um, somewhat true, true, not true, um, that kind of scale. So for students, it'll say something like, the staff at my school treat everyone fairly. For, for the teacher version, it'll, um, an example of an item is, I regularly examine academic and behavior data, data for achievement gaps by race, socioeconomic status, and gender. The results of this survey will be made available in a report that will be published on our website. And the uh, third thing to just report, um, the third ongoing evaluation that we'll be doing this year is our English language education evaluation. So the legal standard is that each year um, we have to conduct sort of an annual evaluation of our programming and make adjustments where needed to ensure language barriers are being overcome. Um, so we've arranged an English language education um, evaluation group, which will be myself, uh, Sherry Fedorowitz, um, Catherine Zinni of Beaverbrook, uh, Erica Nally, the assistant principal at the middle school, and Megan Tomlin. And um, so uh, the first step would be to, to form a team, and then we have to do a data an, um, analysis. We have, to, uh, we have to make sure that we're clear on the number of students making progress in English pro proficiency. We'll be using the access score data to determine this. We'll, we'll establish the number of students achieving fluency in English by using the access score data. And we'll also need to establish the proficiency gap between our district's ELL population and the uh, rest of the population. With that data, we'll set annual goals as, as part of an action plan. So to sum up, just over this year, we'll be conducting three pretty extensive evaluations of our programming for English language education, for the institutional self-evaluation, which is a civil rights component, and a special education program. Um, the last thing I'll just report up to us is just sort of some of the special education professional development activities that are happening um, during the month of October. Um, we'll have job alike groups for our special ed education team chairs, our school psychologists, and our speech language therapists. Um, our team chair at the high school will be, at will be attending the role of executive functioning, the impact of repeated failure and effective strategies for instruction. He'll attend this professional development and share it at a Wave Week Wednesday. Um, so uh, in terms of like what concrete strategies are available and how can we incorporate it in our academic support classrooms. Um, we're sending a wide, uh, a broad contingent of staff members to a, the social thinking conference, which is happening between October 17th and 19th. Um, we're, we're sending about 10 people from Beaverbrook and um, five people from the middle school. Um, and for those who don't know, social thinking is just a uh, curriculum established by uh, Mar uh, Michelle Garcia Winner, who's a, a, a a well-known speech language therapist, which um, just gives sort of concrete ways of conceptualizing social rules in our emotional experience, and it just is known to resonate uh, well with students. And the last step, we just have some, um, some staff members from our high school and from the Woodsdale School attending the Behavior and Down Syndrome um, Conference um, led by Dr. David Stein. Any questions? Thank you, James. First, I have one yep. um, to start. So it goes back to the special education program <laughs> review. And we talked about how pre-K, the referral rate is double. Is there, what, what contingent, I don't know if contingency plans are in place as that, that, if that continues to happen um, to limit. I know in the, pa I mean, in the past, the role, role models have kind of been, is, like I guess what is the contingency plan to limit the amount of kids that are in each teacher for a class size? Oh, right. Yeah, so first thing we need to do is um, just sort of like do a full, assessment of, of the program and we're thinking like currently but also what's been in place for the past few years mm -hmm. so first of all what we want to make sure is just the way we're making eligibility decisions is as as we should um, just because if we compare our preschool identification rate to the state average we're, we're higher mm -hmm. so we just want to make sure that we're um, making clear decision accurate decisions about this and if we're not that's actually a pretty quick fix because it's just kind of going through the basics about what you, what really constitutes a developmental delay for example that's that's one of the most commonly occurring disability categories um, which which just really means that a student is is behind developmental expe expectations but but um, staff may be quick to put a student in, in that category um, when it may not be totally necessary and the result of that is an expansive program so that so that that's step one 
Um, and then um, something else we'll, we'll have to consider too is just sort of how many um, general education sort of role model students we let in the program too, if it continues to, um, if it continues to grow. Okay. Um, these things tend to follow um, statistical trends. Like usually you wouldn't expect more than um, or more than like say 20% mm -hmm. of, of an age group, okay. of um, school aged age group to qualify. Yeah. But like our, our preschool is, is kind of growing more than that. Mm -hmm. so, so my thought is probably what we need to do is just clarify our eligibility criteria. Um, but what is great is that by having Dorsey Yearly help with the evaluation, it's yeah. just that we've got, we couldn't find anyone more, more veteran or more seasoned to, okay. to help us Okay. That. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, when back to the institutional self-evaluation mm -hmm. with the survey, mm. um, um, so like, how many questions do you have? You already done the survey? Have you already put it together? It's what I, I um, not entirely because okay. what I want to do is I know what I'm adapting it on because I've cleared this with Desi to say, hey, do you think this is a valuable model? And I said, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just sort of workshop workshop it at an administrative team meeting. Like I'm aware of how to do an institutional self-evaluation, so like, so I'm gonna determine what the items are that I think are most important and I just wanna share it with the principals to see, you know, to get their feedback on it. But. So I would like to, I don't know if it's allowed, but also, I mean, I understand with the parents and the staff, but can we see the survey before you send it, especially to the students? And I'm concerned with it being, um, put on the website afterwards. Like, can't that go through constant contact? Because then it's accessible to anyone mm. to outside of this district mm. to get that information. Um, so do you mean it's, it's possible for anyone to participate in the survey, or do you mean it's possible for anyone to review the data? Review the data. All right, and so that, so that actually should, to me, uh, so I'll put out a thought, you know, let me know if you disagree. Yeah. Um, I would think that's actually um, helpful for people to know, because you you want to know um, just how open your your school is to people of diverse backgrounds, right? Because if you have a clear understanding of that, then you can set real goals and and sort of have honest discussions and just look at what the problem is directly and say, okay, we need to work on this, and this will inform inform programming. Right. So, I would understand that if. You know, p other people in school systems with diverse backgrounds. But my issue would be, um, you know, somebody looking to make money off of this and then create who knows what—a computer program or, you know, whatever it could be. Mm -hmm. I, I would just like to think further on that one. Okay. So you you want to see the survey first? I want to see the survey first, especially when it comes to the secondary students, um, and then I know know if I'm completely comfortable with it going on our website. The results. I, I'm sorry. I'm not sure that, and I could be wrong on this, that the raw data would go on the website. It would be a, a summary of the data, mm -hmm. correct? Right. And, and I should mention that this is a standard set by the Department of Education. So. So what that suggests is that if I were to randomly pop on a website of a, a Massachusetts town or city, say Saugus, um, what, I, what I would expect to find is the result of a survey like this. So it, it, it's something that's kind of set, you know, set by the state as a state standard that we really should be talking about things that are, that are kind of sensitive r related to diversity in our community. So would your concern be that people would have access to people's individual information? Is that where uh, you're going? No, I don't think that that's okay. what you're intending. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, no. Right. right. And it's like A, B, or C, or mm -hmm. are they writing, you know, would you evaluate what they are saying? No, yep, there's no, um, there's no elaboration for them to, to share, you know, thoughts about that. We would just have to say, you know, to make it concrete, right, we could say that a, a student from so, sort of an underrepresented background, um, um, thinks that their cultural background is not represented in our curriculum, and say that that comes up again and again through through the survey, then we would pick that out as saying something that okay, we need to we need to do more to have culturally responsive curriculum materials because we're seeing our students again and again are seeing this. So I'm not so so what I'm doing is what I, what this what the report would be would be to highlight the recurring themes. So that, so that then it can guide our decision making. 
because the, the thing is what Desi wants is us to be having these conversations about, okay, you know, what are the, what are the barriers that no one intended, but that are coming up related to, you know, um, related to gender or, or cultural background or race? Um, because what Desi is saying is that despite best intentions, this is happening in every town and city in Massachusetts. And we want you looking into it, really getting specific about it, and then talking about how you're going to correct it. So that's really the spirit of, of all this. So was every student mandated to take this? Uh, no. So then I, how I, are your results really going to be accurate? Um, but just in the sense of, it, it's kind of like any survey, right? It's, it's, it's so rare that you can capture 100% of the population. What you can do is you can say how many people did respond. And if it's a significant amount, you can say, look, a significant amount of students participated in the survey. And they're, they're having concerns in, in the X, Y, or Z area. Um, but even, even if, you know, just say a quarter of the students responded, that, that's not really a representation of the full student body. But you can also pull out themes from that. And, and you can say things like, well, to at least a, a quarter of our student body, they're concerned about a specific issue, say sexism in the halls or something like that. And, and, and we still have to take that seriously, right? Because then be like, all right, well, you know, that's still 25% of our student body are thinking this, you know? So it's kind of like, with all surveys, with all statistical tools, it's, it, it just tends to be the case that you can't capture everyone, but they're, they're still helpful in identifying kind of themes. I mean, we've seen that too in the past with other surveys that have been sent out, just the lack of response can be, I mean, I, I think, as long as it, I mean, I think to your point, as long as it's noted, mm -hmm. the like participation percentage, I'm gonna call it, mm -hmm. is noted, I think generally they are. So we, it would call it, I mean, we, obviously we hope for, and I know, um, I know Dr. Fedorovich, you've done stuff in the past with uh, the parents through constant contact with surveys and the results haven't been the greatest. We have more, we have more tools of communicating now, so maybe getting it out there in more venues that it's available for people to get to can help. Um, so that's just, just what a is the time frame that you're looking to have the survey? So every everything that I've said tonight has to be done by August 2019. So th that's part of the corrective action plan, where in one year's time you you show progress toward modifying your school district's behavior. So all of this will be done in the year. It, but in in the case of the survey, the plan was before 2019, so by December. To, um, to at least have the um, survey questions finalized and distributed to the community. Get, leave it open for about a month's time and then get into the data analysis work and then by around May, distribute the report. How will, we, will the um, secondary students, how will they get the survey? Is it on, on the computer, is it paper? Is it something they can do in advisory? Maybe get more up to get more people to participate? Mm. Um, everyone has a laptop in advisory, you set 15 minutes and they do the survey. Is that something that could be done? So yeah, some good points made there. So what I would say is that um, with 100% certainty, the survey will be done electronically mm -hmm. and that's because it helps with the analysis of the, right. of the data. Because it could be upwards of you know 500 or so surveys. So no matter what, it will be electronic. As to the form it will take, that's, um, that's to be determined. I think your suggestion of using advisory is, um, is appropriate. And of course, there, there will be opt-out options. And, uh, this, this wouldn't be mandated at all. But, but the more students that participate, the, the better off we are, because the, the truer depiction we have of any obstacles there are for students, and then we can kind of respond appropriately. So when you have the survey, though, and they're using their own computers, you guys know who they are, and what ethnic background, or you know, if they're a boy or a girl or whatever automatically with that. Um, yeah, so that could be possible, but to be honest, my skills aren't that savvy. So um, <laughs> what I would do is I, I would just look in, in terms of individual items and, and um, I, I wouldn't take into account demographic background and none of this would be punitive. It would just be, honestly, it's just to have conversations about how, how students feel while they're here. Do, are there any students who feel discriminated against about uh, due to something beyond their control, be it you know biological sex or their, their racial background or things like that? Because because again, Desi really wants us to, to think critically about that, especially in a town that we know is his, historically very homogenous, right? It, it's towns like this where it sounds like these where, where students of diverse backgrounds can have the most challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have a question, but switching gears from the survey, if that's okay, yeah. unless anyone has any other follow-up. Um, 
we do the program review every year, and I've sat on the other side of the table listening to this for a few years now. Are, are we typically, have, we typically have a corrective action plan? Um, so the coordinator program review happens every five years. Okay, so. Um, uh, and so we now have, we have to kind of come up with a plan. Because one of my questions, the only reason mm -hmm. I ask that is, this pre-KK 1-2, that you described on the special education program review slide. Mm -hmm. Is this something different than we've done in the past? Yes, yep. And so the reason why I made the distinction about when we do it in terms of like every five years mm -hmm. as opposed to every year. So like this this is something that just happens, you know, fairly rarely. Mm -hmm. And so it's so it's kind of a big deal. And so and when you get the results you have to take it very seriously. And you got a year to respond and accomplish all these things. So so anything else you might be thinking of in terms of an evaluation is, is probably different because this hasn't happened in, in the past in okay. the past five years. Because we used to get a, or we used to get a report that Dipna would give yearly on what what am I correct confusing? Correct action plan from previous years. And, okay, and just the work made. of it. Correct. Okay, yeah. um, and the work leading up, up to, to this yeah. coordinated program, gotcha. which is a two yeah. year. Because it's really a cycle. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my only other question was on the English language evaluation page. Um, you talked about who's on the team and that the team is going to do data analysis of all of these areas mm -hmm. and then come up with an action plan. So as I was looking at the team, you know, from a teacher's lens, I, I noticed we're not, we don't have any, um, besides the middle school English teacher, there's not an ELL teacher, there's an ELL director. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think it's that important that the ELL not to, not, I, I know the ELL teachers are very busy with the instruction that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, but when we get to that last bullet of the action plan, mm -hmm. um, just it might, have you considered including ELL teachers as part of um, the conversations maybe that will take place after the data analysis? Um, yeah, no, I think that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, so the evaluation plan that we'll be conducting is actually, um, the specifics of it are, are um, provided by the state. So they tell you who should um, be on the, on the curriculum. The fact that, you know, we need our curriculum director and you need right. the student service director. So, so that's why you see the composition there because that meets basically the minimum requirements. Mm -hmm. So you bring up a good point. Like we could, you know, absolutely fill out the team. These were just people who are part of conversations who, who volunteered. Yeah. Um, so the, the ELL director, Elizabeth Dupre, she's someone who's um, been in the district a few years and has served you know, both roles, the ELL director position, but also the teacher position. Mm -hmm. So one thing I can say is, you know, I feel comfortable with her ability to determine, you know, to, 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 to see our action plan through the eyes of an ELL teacher, but um, she may not want to wear both hats in those conversations, and so therefore I think, you know, I, I agree with you that, you know, that, that would, only add value. Yeah, and more, um, yeah, more eyes can't hurt. How many ELL right. teachers do we have now in the district? Uh, I believe four. And so, the, and my, I guess my concern, and it's not that you're disagreeing, I just think that the this all comes back to data and performance. That's where the state gets some of their information on, mm -hmm. on how our subgroups perform. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's ultimately on the teachers, the four, that mm -hmm. are instructing. To, um, to deliver and change instruction in a way that produces results that will look different if we're measuring student success by way of standardized tests. Um, so it might just be nice for them, or at least one of them, to be um, part of decision making and conversations around the action plan because I feel like it's typically those teachers that go out and then act and, mm -hmm. and deliver and hope to deliver the results that we hope for for our students. So that yeah. was, that's my thought on that. Yeah. No, I think it's a, com a compelling point, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just from knowing a number of the ELL teachers, they're a good company, but also very thoughtful, and I think they'd be right. um, you know, a valuable part, so I'm happy to bring them on board. That's it for me. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything? Mm -hmm. awesome. Can I just make yeah. a quick yeah. comment? Yeah, um, I don't know if one of the underpinnings here that you may have noticed is James is really kind of kicking down the door on our, on our neediest yeah. areas, uh, neediest areas identified by student need. Um, and so I just want to commend you, from my perspective, for, for going after these critical areas. With enthusiasm to boot. Right. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Dr. Vidarowitz. I just did. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, good evening. Hi. Sorry about the. Yeah, so no, sorry. Right, you're sorry. between the laptop, the printer, and the staples. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Things come in threes, so we're good. We're good to move forward. Train. Uh, so everybody has, uh, make sure everybody has a copy of the presentation for this evening. And I'm going to present on professional development and family engagement resources. I'm going to try and pop in what slide I'm in so you can follow along. It gets a little bit complicated. So on the second slide, I'm going to provide an overview of PD offerings and feedback results from our August 28th, our September 13th, and our new curriculum professional development. I'll then transition into family engagement resources, both within the district and outside the district. Anybody have any questions on the agenda before I move forward? No. So slide three. Here I'm going to provide you with an overview of the anatomy of the survey. For PD feedback surveys, an anonymous survey went out to all participants the day of the professional development. In the survey, demographics were obtained such as the PD that the teachers or educators attended and their primary role in the district. For example, was the participant a general education teacher? Were they a special education teacher, a nurse, a psychologist? The purpose was to target feedback to target feedback responses so that we obtain the results from each professional development separately. Slide four. The second part of the questionnaire asks specifically about the professional development itself. We used a Likert scale to capture the quantitative information from most useful to not useful. And then we used qualitative data so that we could capture information such as open comments or um, shared information that educators wanted to share. So the first question asks whether educators learned from the professional development and can they use it to improve student outcomes. The second question asks whether they thought the facilitator was knowledgeable. The third asks if it was a good use of time. The fourth question is looking for feedback on the impact of professional development toward professional responsibilities. And the last question is strictly looking for qualitative feedback, and that's an open-ended question. So the next few slides, I'm going to review the results of the feedback. Does anybody have any questions related to the demographics or the Likert skill open-ended questions? No, I don't. All right, moving on to slide five. On our full professional <coughs> development day on August 28th, the educators filled out the professional development survey for each separate PD session that they attended. So surveys were provided once the PD started and were given approximately 10 minutes at the end to fill out the survey. Our choices included specific professional development that were geared toward different grade levels and different subjects. So for example, for our grades five through 12, we looked at our instructional technology such as Canvas and Eduscape. <coughs> Pre-K, we looked at the Waterford online reading program and also our interactive whiteboard use. For grades kindergarten through four, we brought in a trainer from McGraw-Hill to look specifically at the digital component for the advanced use of the Wonders program. And here at Split, grades one through four looked at a workshop model, independent reading, balanced literacy, and center models while kindergarten worked on Smart Start, which is the beginning of the program for Wonders, which kicks the kids off for the Wonders program, getting them involved with routines, which is really important at the grade K level. For our specialists, such as psychologists, um, speech language pathologists are <coughs> two chairs in this uh, special education department. They worked on job alike groups and looked at specific learning disabilities in Q Global, which is an assessment related to this special field. Our nurses worked on district-wide curriculum, looking at things from the Department of Public Health. And then we had some teachers who were specialists at the elementary level looking at curriculum writing. We received 163 responses. 103 were received on the same day. Since we have approximately 164 educators within the district, um, they filled out a professional development survey for each professional development. And in, so in the case on the 28th, at least two professional development sessions were provided. So that's why the numbers, it looks like 163 people took the survey out of 164, but some of them were double sessions. 
so we don't have an accurate percentage on that. The overall feedback was positive, but of course there were some suggestions which we used to guide our September 13th professional development, and we're looking at guiding for our November 6th. In addition, our survey results were shared with our teacher leader committee, which is called the Curriculum and Professional Development Council, also known as CPDC, which is comprised of teachers, curriculum coordinators, directors, department heads, principals, and technology. Further, we asked this committee, the CPDC, um, we asked them to provide some additional feedback and suggestions for future PD. And this is because they are working with teachers in their departments and within their grade level so that they can bring back the conversations that are being had. For example, instructional resources for learning was something that came up. So more targeted information toward Canvas or Eduscape or specific curriculums that we're looking at. Maybe it's the workshop or balanced literacy model, or maybe it's just the building-based focus items such as NEASC at the high school level. Are there any questions regarding the August 28th professional development feedback? Not a question, just a comment on um, the feedback being positive with some suggestions. I just think it's important where this is, we talked about in past meetings where these surveys have sort of been um, not at the fore, done, but not maybe done consistently, and now we're bringing them back to life, doing them anonymous, anonymously and regularly. I think the goal maybe needs to be to continue to remind people um, to give authentic and honest feedback and to expect that it's not always going to be positive. Um, so that we, cause, because if, it, if it's always positive, the whole cycle just becomes useless again. Um, and it makes your job really hard where you can't make these decisions for the next step. So I think it's always great when feedback's positive, but um, to maybe just continue to send that message out to teachers who, um, that it's okay when things are, that if not every training is positive, that you can um, really be honest, that we, we want you to be honest about what's working and what's not working, um, just so that you can plan what you're going to do next. Because I know, as someone who fills those out, it took me a while to learn that I could be, they told me it was anonymous and that, you know, but it, it's still a nerve-wracking thing. Um, how honest can I be? And I, I think from the committee level, I, I, you, do you feel like it's important that um, people are almost brutally honest? About always, it? Yeah, yeah, always. Just, I mean, yeah, you definitely always need them to be honest. That's a definite, yeah, so. We, I think feedback is great. If I can comment? Yeah. So that was kind of my nice way of saying, yes, we did get some um, really honest comments and feedback. So that is something that is shared and that we do look at. And we take those suggestions and we gear it toward what we want to do next. So there is, I, I feel like from what I've seen um, in the feedback from the committee that there are some honest, there is some honest feedback. And there are some people that don't hold back. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think, that's, well. I think that's great too, as long as and just continue to harp on that, I guess, for lack of just let them, just remind them or whatever, so. Absolutely, yes. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Look, if I could, just the, the actions speak a lot of the words. When you collect information and you actually use it to inform your decisions, people can see that their comments are informing the professional development. Those actions speak louder than words, too, because they, they can see it firsthand, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, slide six. On our half, Day, professional Development Day on September 13th. Again, the educators filled out the PD survey. Surveys were provided once the professional development had started and were given approximately 10 minutes at the end of the survey to fill that out. Again, our choices includes, included specific professional development geared toward a lot of follow-up. For So for example, you might see Waterford again. That was a follow-up to the training that they had. The teachers wanted some practice using that and how they can integrate it into their classroom. Beaverbrook had some culture and climate. Grades three and four wanted a follow up on the independent reading workshop, balanced literacy and centers. Our grade five worked on science standards alignment. Grade six had training from a trainer for our new ELA program, which is EMC Windows and Mirrors, they were able to work together collaboratively on that. 
um, grades seven and eight wanted some targeted training geared toward Canvas that was very specific, so that was provided for them. High school worked on NEASC in preparation for their NEASC visit. We had follow-up with our team chairs on specific learning disabilities in the Q Global again. Goal setting in the student support plans, that's the SSPs for the psychologists. Nurses continued with the Department of Public Health updates and regulations and our speech language pathologists worked on functional communication skills. So some of, some of what you see here was directed by the feedback we received on the 28th. Uh, we received 132 responses from the survey, which is about 80% of the staff that day, 114 on the same day, which is about 70%. We left the survey open for about five days just to make sure people were able to, and a reminder was sent out. Again, overall, the feedback was positive, and I think it was more positive on this one because it was based on feedback from the 28th. And again, there were always suggestions that help us guide. The results were taken to the CPDC committee, which is our teacher leader committee, which I was just talking about. And there seems to be this theme that they want to continue with some of the um, professional development we had started, maybe tweaking some here and there, but continue on because it helps to sustain and maintain the professional development and the learning and also to strengthen it. So that was some positive feedback. And we're also looking at items for the November 6th Professional Development Day. Any questions regarding the 13th? <coughs> Which is a similar format. It's just nice to know. I feel like we pr know we know a lot more about what everybody's doing, um, and I think parents in the community are getting more information about when school is out of session or there's a half a day session. Um, I don't know how the community feels about that, but I think that it's nice to know um, what staff is working on. Um, so thank you for getting this. I like the way that it's organized. Great, thank you. Okay, slide seven. So we obtained some new curriculum this year. New curriculum was piloted last year and chosen by the teachers using the new materials and textbook rubric. And this was developed, this was a guide that was developed by our teacher committee, which is the, again, the CPDC. We work frequently and a lot together on a lot of initiatives. Teachers were provided a choice of curriculum to try and they were able to use the materials in the classes as a trial last year. So they chose Based on the rubric and the quantitative and qualitative feedback, they chose these new curriculums. So what we were looking at is providing professional development at the beginning of the year for them so that they could get started with it and feel comfortable. Grade six received training on the new ELA program, which is the EMC Windows and Mirrors. Grades three through five received training on the new science curriculum from National Geographic. This is used in conjunction with our inquiry-based FOSS kits, which are full option science systems kits, and they include laboratories and activities related to science. Overall, this particular feedback, because it was very, very directed toward a specific curriculum, was exceptionally high, and teachers got a lot out of the training. We are going to offer another training for them in the winter for the teachers. Once they've started using the curriculum for a period of time, usually questions will come up and we want to make sure that we can support the teachers to further that in, along the year. Any questions on the new curriculum professional development before I move on to family engagement? Who's the publisher for EMC grade six? It's EMC. It, okay, so no, like no correlation that our K to five wonders not, not, it's not a similar publisher, it's just an entirely different Right, program. and it's, it's a great transition here for our kids going into seventh grade because there it's more um, teacher-guided curriculums, more open resources, more novels and things like that. So it's, it's really a great transition program and that was something that came from the grade six teachers as well. It was, they had the option to go with Wonders and when we initially met a few years ago and they chose to go with their own program as a transition year. Just curious. Yeah. Any other questions? 
I just want to say a quick thank you to the teachers, the teacher leaders, the department heads, directors, and the administrators for working as a team to guide the professional development to meet and to collaborate and to work at looking at the survey results. I think it's really, it's, um, it's strengthening the professional development program and really getting the feedback for the directed professional development. Okay, slide number eight. So we covered the professional development. I wanna cover family engagement next. Family engagement is a great way to promote learning and well-being of students as well as open communication. It fosters partnerships resulting in the sharing of the learning to promote healthy behaviors, strengthening relationships, and also having a positive impact in academic achievement. One great way in slide nine, one great way in Abington to engage in the family school connection is through our curriculum night, which is tomorrow night from 6 to 7.15. Um, I see that people on Facebook are sharing the post and adding the post, so I absolutely love that. Um, I know teachers, we have a lot of teachers coming this year, and there's a lot of excitement around it, so Great. Um, I think we're all really excited about that. Teachers have put in a lot of hard work, so I hope we get a lot of community representation tomorrow night. I hope so. <laughs> The jump from year one to year two and that for participation too was incredible. So looking forward to seeing year three. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're moving it to the auditorium mm -hmm. to start and mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's, it's, I don't know if it'll be full. <laughs> In my head, it's gonna be full and it's gonna be great. So I'm hoping it's that we have a great turnout this year and we do anticipate a strong, strong outcome um, just based on last year. So any questions about the curriculum night? Just again, it's tomorrow night for elementary K through six in the auditorium at six o'clock here. And then we'll have our breakout sessions. Okay. okay. All right, another great way, slide 10, for families and guardians to stay connected is through our Everything Teaching and Learning at Abington Facebook page. And I noticed that we got really popular over the last month. So thank you school thank committee you for the help. and teachers <laughs> and whatnot. So this is a great venue for families to get a glimpse or a snapshot into what the kids are doing in the schools during the day. The excitement that occurs in the classrooms that you might not always see when you go home from the kids, the activities that they're working on, the lessons, the events. Teachers are excited about the page as well. I sent an email to the teachers asking for any feedback or anything they want to include, and I got flooded. So it's, um, I'm asking them to send things in and working with the department heads and the directors and teacher leaders to, to help pull all that together as a community page. So it's really fantastic. So I just want to say thank you to the, the teachers for sharing and being so open for um, either myself or the department heads, directors to come into the classroom and, and share. So any questions regarding the Teaching and Learning Facebook page? Okay, slide 11. Last, I wanted to share the Massachusetts Department of Education resource page. It's, I think it's so important that we have that school, home, family connection and people are involved with their child's learning. So it's a family-friendly guide to the standards and I wish the link were up, but you can see the link at the top of the slide and it is in blue even though it's in black and white and you can search Family Friendly Guides to the Standards for Massachusetts. It's a wonderful bridge that exists between understanding what we use in the schools and curriculum instruction and assessment and how families can become engaged at home to help with their students' learning. You can see at the bottom of the slide, there's something called, I circled it there, Parent Guides. <clears throat> and this is designed specifically for families. So on page 12, if you click on the parent guides on this section, it takes you to various grade levels and standards associated with the different grade levels. It comes in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese. So it really reaches a huge population. On slide 13, um, this was just an example. If you were to click on, say, grade two, it brings you to a welcome page that provides resources for helping your child and making the connection to school. So for example, they give you questions you can ask your kids at home about school or targeted questions toward uh, different subjects. You can see on the side on the right, you can see mathematics and questions you can ask related to grade two math, whether you're in the grocery store or running errands or just having the ability to talk to your kids at home and make that real life connection. 
So again, the purpose is to bridge the learning and the understanding between school and home, provides an avenue to discuss your child's <coughs> day, and find out ways to assist with learning, and also be able, there's a section there, topics you can discuss with your child's teacher. So I think it really helps to bond that, that school-home um, connection. Are there any questions related to the family engagement? I have a comment, not so much a question. So I think I didn't know about this. What you just the um, the Department of Education website. I think that's great because I know my kids are younger, and sometimes it's hard to get information out of them. And I'm sure as they get older, it'll be diff harder for a different reason. I don't know if this was something you could speak to the buildings about or the teachers to include it. Like most of the schools send home a newsletter each week yep. um, to include on there, make it known. Maybe the teachers, if when they send home newsletters, can send as an idea for parents to look at, ask, talk to your kids about different things. So that was just a comment, suggestion. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Or mention it at curriculum night even. Yeah. If there's time to just show them quickly. Maybe there's not, but air in the future. I didn't know this existed either. It's, it's mm -hmm. nice. It's really I got more for you next time too. Okay. <laughs> a little bit at a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think places. too, um, you've done so much work. Sherry's a one woman show with curriculum. Um, some districts are fortunate enough to have people who take care of just math or just science or just ELA and she does it all for all grades with the support of department heads and um, the team that you described. But I think it's great that the Facebook page showcases some of that work that um, has been happening, but then also all this PD that we talk about, it all sort of comes to life in, in what you share on that page. So I think it's a nice addition. It's a great team to work with. Yeah. So, thank you. Can I just oh, go make ahead. a yeah, go comment ahead. if the committee members, I just want to commend Sherry. You can see how, um, how deeply she's diving into these topics and not only diving deeply into it, but the follow-up because your actions do speak louder than your words. and one of the tried and true ways to improve a district is, is through professional development. And if that's effective, that will we'll make great gains. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next, report of the assistant superintendent, Alicia. Thank you. Yep. I have a brief uh, school building committee update. Um, we are currently engaged in our final punch list of the exterior work around the building. Um, the exterior shed that holds the irrigation has been completed and I'm happy to say we're back watering on well water and uh, they're currently finishing uh, testing and adjustments to, uh, to the irrigation system. Today, a uh, request for proposals went out for um, guardrail slash uh, fencing slash guardrails around the front um, lawn or front fields. So uh, we're hoping to have those installed prior to the winter. And um, probably the final aspect of the project will be not till the springtime, and that'll be the repaving of the boulevard. So that'll um, most likely be kind of our culminating activity after all the trucks have, uh, have been in and out of the site for a couple of years. Um, that'll be the final, final project. So. Question, before sure. the trucks pull off permanently. Um, yes. The hot water issue, have yep. you heard about that here? What's I happening? Have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I, I will try. Um, so there are a number of um, mixing valves throughout the system that start in the boiler room. And then there's mixing valves in the boiler room, there's mixing valves um, at each sink. And shockingly, each time there's been a problem, it's been a different issue. So there was a problem with the mixing valve at the boiler, at the hot water heater early in the year. Um, I know the last time it happened, on the, and it's mostly in the middle school bathrooms, that it was, um, it was mixing valves actually at the, at the uh, going into the bathrooms. So there's mixing valves apparently at the water heater, going into the, um, adjusting temperatures as they go into the bathrooms and then at the sinks. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my understanding is after the last incident, those were replaced and we... Um, yeah, we I experienced be. it myself where the water was like scorching yeah. hot, but then I know there were some announcements being made to use hand sanitizer yeah. versus the sink and it seems, that seems silly. So, um, so, so each time it's happened, I can tell you it has been remediated um, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been able to get 
uh, the maintenance department, Jason Lynn and Lance Hammond, uh, get right over here and are able to make whatever adjustments. The curious part has been um, why why did it happen? Yeah, um, and so. just you know making sure that like before they're totally done with us that we can have mm -hmm. our water at yep. a temperature that is um, something we don't have to think about. We stick yep. our hands under and clean them up and be done. <laughs> I agree. All right, thanks. Sure. Oh, so uh, is, that, uh, is that water mixer? Th is that the thing that was near the tennis courts over there? Uh, the irrigation shed, yeah. That's the irrigation shed. Yep. So is that, uh, is that just, that's all good back running? That's back running. Oh, cool. Yep, it is. Uh, we had the issue in the springtime mm -hmm. when we had uh, um, we had a problem, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's been all replaced, and all new controls, all new, um, a new shed, and uh, they're just finishing up the um, adjustments, and uh, but we are watering off well water. So that was a was that like a construction error, or is it just like a random random thing that happened? That actually, I talked this afternoon with the insurance company, and there's still a question of why or how it happened. Um, so yes, it was. Um, it has been deemed not to have been a construction issue, um, but they, there's no determination yet, or, and there may never be, of why it happened. Thank you. Any other building questions? No. My second item is around EpiPen information and school bus travel, and I'd like to thank Jackie and Lisa for meeting uh, this summer and to talk about um, how we can better um, inform our bus drivers about the um, the needs, the medical needs of our of our students. I don't know if you either of you wanted to speak to that. Would you like me to? Is this? Um so we met about having the bus drivers, um, the training for delivering an EpiPen for children with allergies and also who, the responsibility of whether it's a bus driver or not, um, yep. if there was an emergency situation. But we came up with some information, I guess, information sheet. And is this, how did this, was this delivered to kids who have allergies? Is that how this went out? Do you want me to yeah, you can. Okay, because I don't know if you want to. No, the only addition I had was just around language. Um, we looked carefully at the language of some of it. No, it wasn't that these things weren't happening, mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to be really respectful of um, parents and families who struggle with allergies. It is serious, and so we wanted the language that goes out to um, and that we use with our drivers to just reflect the, the nature of how serious it is. And um, so, little shifts in language, we felt like maybe painted a clearer picture of um, expectations for students who may have allergies that are riding our buses. And also provide consistency. Mm -hmm. So there's a consistent message regardless of the nurse or the parent or the child, I think is another mm -hmm. um, thing that happened. So, um, so, we came, so we came up with uh, EpiPen information for school bus travel and a fact sheet. And any parent who came in to meet with the school nurse around their child's allergy was given, and that rode the school bus, was given this information um, around uh, that what would happen in an emergency, um, how our, our bus drivers are trained to call 911 if there is an emergency, um, that uh, some um, criteria around student self-carrying EpiPens, um, and the no food policy on our school buses. So um, parents were given a information sheet, and again, I think it's important that it was a consistent message given to uh, the same message regardless of your school, regardless of, um, of your child, regardless <coughs> of the parent. Then the second part, which I think is, is probably, I think, one of the best pieces that came out of it, is an information sheet that the nurse gave to the parent. And the, inf the parent would fill out the information sheet around uh, what their child's allergy is and what the signs have been uh, in the past, because that can change for any uh, subsequent reaction a child may have. And then a place to put the child's picture on it. And that was then handed to the bus driver. And if the parent chose to, um, this is where um, HIPAA and student rights, and if the parent wants to do that, this is a great tool that they give to the bus driver, and then it would stay on the bus. And there was some confusion, I'll admit, at the beginning of the year. Um, 
the telephone game, you know, who I talked to at the bus company and how that message got down to the drivers, but we um, fixed that uh, very quickly as soon as I became aware that the drivers, some of the drivers didn't know what to do with it. Um, but the idea is that it would stay on the bus, so regardless of who's driving the bus, if there's a substitute driver, they have the bus routes and the students' names, mm -hmm. and they'll also have this information sheet. So. Um, so thank you for to both of you for your work. Have on we that. gotten any feedback? Um, this, this is like parents have actually given this to yes, the bus driver, have. and, yep. and the bus drivers have it. And it's like on a clipboard yep. in each bus. Yep. Or it's in a it's place in each okay. bus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. This, okay. I think this is really important. Okay. So thank you for helping with this. Thank you. Good job, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, all three. Um, before we get into um, the next thing, I just want to mention um, this past Sunday, the Abington Greenway Boosters had a, their door to door drive. Um, received an email, I'm just going to read it. Today we had a record breaking number of student athlete volunteers with more than 140 kids showing up to volunteer, which resulted in an unofficial total of $10,500 before mail in and online donations. By going off of previous years, we anticipate a total of nearly $13,000 to come in. I'd also like to thank 35 adult volunteer drivers who donated their Sunday afternoon to drive our kids, and this was also a record number of volunteers. Um, so thank you to everybody. Um, thank you to all the volunteers, all the students that helped out, um, bringing $13,000 for the Green Wave Boosters. That's fantastic, and it speaks to this town and this community. So, um, Next, uh, establish our next school committee meeting as Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018 here in the Middle High School Library at 7 p.m. Um, some dates to remember. Tomorrow night, as Dr. Fedorowicz said, is uh, elementary curriculum night. In the, um, it says seminar room here. It's in the auditorium at 6 p.m., 6 to 7.15 in the um, Abington Middle High School Auditorium. Uh, Saturday night, uh, the Abington Education Foundation is hosting a back-to-school event for parents and guardians at Players Sports Bar in Rockland at 7 p.m. Um, money raised here will go to benefit the Edmonton Education Foundation. They provide grants back to the school um, for any number of things throughout the year. On Wednesday, October 3rd, um, is the Greenway Boosters meeting here in the library at the Middle High School at 7 p.m. On Thursday, October 4th, um, there's a CPAC event meeting at the Middle High School Auditorium, which is a change in venue from the original. Um, at 7 p.m., a presentation by Jessica Minahan called Strategies for Reducing Anxiety in Children. Um, this is a free event open to anyone. Um, it'll be in the auditorium. Can I just um, yes. a moment just yeah, highlight? Yeah. I've seen her speak before. She's outstanding um, in, in identifying needs in, in kids, students. So if you are a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a coach, if you are somehow anywhere involved in the lives of students or children in, in, as, a, as an adult in their lives, um, I'd recommend attending. So. She's she doesn't great. speak very often anymore locally, um, so we're, it's sort of a treat that she's coming to Abington. So we're very lucky. Um, thank you. Thanks. Yep, no problem. On uh, Monday, October 8th is uh, Columbus Day. All schools and offices are closed. The next day, Tuesday, October 9th, Abington School Building Committee meeting here in the library at 6 p.m. Uh, Tuesday, October 23rd, um, before our meeting, is the Music Parents meeting in the cafeteria at 6 p.m. And then as I mentioned about Tuesday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. will be our next meeting here in the library. Um, There's some information, oh, you want to hit on any? Just if I could uh, highlight one piece of information from, from the items in, in the packet. Private and non-private school summary, uh, September 2018 is, uh, is in your packet. It um, looks like this. So you're hearing a lot of information about um, audits and accountability and indicators of accomplishment in the Avenue Public Schools. In my mind, this is one of the most important and one of the most telling pieces of information that I can share with you. So if you, if you look at our, his, our history going back to 1980, um, we go back a long time here in terms of information we're providing you. And then in the, in the far right column on the sheet, you can see the number of the percentage of students who have left our district to attend other schools. And there's, there's information in between. There's the total number of students, there's the number of people that have applied for private high schools, uh, the percent that have been accepted, the percent that have attended, the I mean, total number of applicants. 
and then there's non-private high schools like the vocational school or Norfolk Aggie, and then, then there's the total of those that have attended. So in the far right is really um, numbers lie and liars uh, figure, or figures lie and liars figure. You, you can't fake this. This is the overall per capita number. So we've, we're down from a high watermark of a terrible recession we had in uh, 9-10, where 47% left our graduating classes, to today, 10.5%. Um, so um, that means that we're retaining more students than we have ever retained in the Avenue Public Schools uh, to complete their uh, public school experience with us, their educational experience with us. And, um, you know, I never, I never ever begrudge any family for making a private school decision. There are family traditions. There are other reasons, um, religious or and many other reasons that people would do that. Um, putting all of those reasons that families have aside, this number indicates, again, that we are keeping more of our students in the Abington Public Schools than ever in the history of the Abington Public Schools. That means that more of our, of our community are engaged, more in our community are invested in, in the schools. Um, and um, so uh, that also helps us with our, with the last, you know, maybe last but not least is our Chapter 70 funding. Um, it helps uh, sustain us. Um, it helps on the town side of the books because it's fewer students that are going to the vocational school. That's a bill that they pay. Um, moreover, it means that people are, are happy and satisfied uh, with the work that we're doing in the Avenue Public Schools. So I just want to point that out to you. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle. Danielle, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Danielle. So I know that it helps us with the funding. Mm. With that number, if it stays the same, is that is that a worry for number of students for spacing in the school and for FTE employees? And for what? For what? FTE employees, if there was an increase in the class size for the amount of FTEs for position. So with an increase of um, student population comes a reimbursement from the state. So the FTE is is covered by that because you're able to grow your staff as you grow your student population. Um, in terms of space and size, that doesn't worry me as much as the fact that there are 300 housing starts in Abington right now. And they will be coming on the books over a course of a number of years. You don't know if, you don't know if they'll all come on the books. You don't know if some will come on the books. You don't know how many of them will have school-aged children. You don't know what age groups those will be. And so that's something every school system tracks. We do demographic studies all of the time and, and, and track it. Um, and so um, it's always a worry is the answer. It's always something we look at. Am I overly worried about it today? I'm, I'm not. We built the building as large as we could per square footage per child. We argued with MSBA. We went in and argued with them three times. And um, brought them our information, and they made some accommodation for us. But they built this school out as big as they would allow us to build out. And so if that day ever comes that, that we need more room, that's a good problem to have. It's a good question, too. We did add a .6 English teacher this year. Right. We did add a .6 English teacher this year at the high school to address that increase that we saw last year. So. Anybody else have anything? Um, so at this point, um, we're, I'm going to ask the committee to go into executive session by roll call vote for the purpose of discussion, discussing under Section 21 of the Open Meeting Law contract negotiations with Peter Schaefer, Superintendent of Schools, and not to return to regular session. So I need a roll call yes vote. Yes. 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 Thank you. Sherry. Mm-hmm.